So an isomorphism is a function from a group G to a group H that, first of all, is a one-to-one -one correspondence of the elements of G with the elements of H, and second of all, it respects the operations in G and H, so that the product of associated elements in G is associated with the associated product of elements in H. What we want to know now is, is this notion of isomorphism as strong as we would like it to be? Does it guarantee that any element in G will be associated with an element in H that has all the same properties as the element did in G? That's what we're going to do in this video. And then in the next video, we'll ask the question not about individual elements, but about entire substructures within those groups, subgroups in G, subgroups in H. Are they associated in ways that have identical properties as well? The answer turns out to be yes, which is somehow surprising, given that our definition of isomorphism only has those two criteria, one-to-one -one correspondence and respecting products. So let's see why elements in G and elements in H, if G and H are isomorphic, must have all the same properties that we would expect them to have. So let's suppose that the groups G and H are isomorphic, and we're going to call phi the isomorphism. The idea is that if I pick up an element of G, and I then cross over using the isomorphism phi to associate it with an element of H. That the idea we're going to try to prove is that phi of G as an element of H has all the same properties as G had as an element of G. So that the name might have changed, but all the properties remain the same. So there's going to be seven different ways in which we're going to substantiate this idea. And all of them are going to come with these implicit quantifiers, that they're going to be true for any elements A and B in the group G, and any integer k. All right, so what are some examples? First of all, every isomorphism sends the identity element of G to the identity element in H. It associates the identity of one group with the identity of another group. Secondly, it associates the powers of elements in one group to powers of its image in the other group. Phi of the kth power of A is the same thing as the kth power of phi of A. So powers commute with isomorphisms. What's interesting about this is that I've quantified k over the integers. So this is not only supposed to be true for, say, positive natural number powers of, uh, of an element, but also for the zeroth power, which, by the way, the zeroth power is the identity element, and since uh, the zeroth power of a, phi of e, and then phi of e on this side, that's just clear by the, by the identity of identity property. It's clear by induction when k is a positive integer. Let's actually run through that induction proof just to flex those induction muscles. But then after this, I also want to show that it's true for negative integer powers as well. What's the negative integer power of an element in a group mean? It means a power of the inverse. So if we can show that homomorphisms, isomorphisms, send inverses to inverses, then once I know that it's true for all positive integers, I'll also get that it's true for all negative integers as well. So let's do the induction proof. If k is greater than or equal to 1, then phi of a to the k is equal to phi of a to the power k. Well, my base case for k equals 1 is actually not a good place to start because it doesn't connect to the, the second case. So for k equals 1, the statement is obvious. Phi of a is equal to phi of a. Right? Um, so our base case for this will take k equals 2. So when k is equal to 2, what's phi of a squared? going to be? Well, a squared is a times a, using the operation of the group g. But because phi has the homomorphism property, phi of a times a can be split up into phi of a times phi of a. And what does that mean? It means exactly phi of a squared. And therefore, we have verified this statement for the case a equals 2. k equals 2, sorry. That's our base case. To do the induction, we first state our inductive hypothesis. Assume that this statement is true for some integer k. So assume that phi of the kth power is the kth power of phi of a. Then in the inductive step, we wish to prove that this is true for the k plus first power, that phi of the k plus first power of a is the k plus first power of phi of a. How do we prove that? Well, we need to somehow get from this expression back to an expression where we can use our inductive hypothesis. How's that going to happen? Well, we need to somehow relate the k plus first power of a back to the kth power of a. We can do that by just peeling off one power of a from that power. So k to the a to the k plus 1 is a to the k times a to the 1. 
And now that I have a times in here, the homomorphism property comes to the rescue one more time. It tells me I can split phi of the product into the product of the phi's. Phi of a to the k times phi of a to the 1. But what is phi of a to the k? By our induction hypothesis, it's equal to phi of a quantity to the power k. We apply that hypothesis, phi of a to the power k, times another phi of a, and that gives me exactly the k plus first power of phi of a, completing the induction proof. So now we know that for any positive integer, k, phi of the kth power of a agrees with the kth power of phi of a. But remember my claim was that this is supposed to be true for all integers, not just for the positive integers. So let's also establish separately that it's true for k equals negative 1. If I can show that inverses, uh, the when k is equal to minus 1, phi of the inverse is the inverse of phi of a, then it will follow that negative all the negative exponents work for this as well. So how do we do that? How do we show that phi of a inverse is the inverse of phi of a? Well, to do that, we'll just use the inverse property. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by phi of a. By the inverse property, phi of a times the inverse of phi of a is going to equal the identity element. It turns out to be the identity element of h, but I didn't decorate that here. On the other hand, over here, phi of a times phi of a inverse, I can't conclude that that's the identity because my inverse is trapped inside of my, uh, my isomorphism here. But what I can do is I can use the homomorphism property backwards to get this a and this a inverse together. Because after all, the product of the phi's is equal to phi of the product of a with a inverse. But what is a times a inverse? In g, by the inverse property, that's phi of e. And therefore, reading this from beginning to end, I find out that on one hand I have phi of e, on the other hand I have e. But by the first property in this list, those two are equal to one another. And then since those two are equal to one another, I look back at this middle equation here, phi of a times phi of a inverse is equal to phi of a times the inverse of phi of a, and then use the cancellation property to get rid of the phi of a's and justify what that means phi of a inverse is the inverse of phi of a. Therefore, Isomorphisms not only send identity to identity and powers to powers, isomorphisms also carry inverses to inverses. By the way, something you should notice about this proof is I never at any point used the fact that phi is a bijection. I only had to use the inverse property that exists in any group and the homomorphism property. So that might be a clue to you, it should be a clue to you as a mathematician, that this, these statements so far are true not just for isomorphisms, but also for functions which meet the homomorphism property but which don't meet the bijection criteria. Those are called homomorphisms of groups, and therefore they also satisfy properties 1 and 2. Alright, so what else can we guarantee? I'm not going to do as many proofs from here on out. Um, what else can we say? Well, let's suppose I have two elements of G that commute with one another. AB is equal to BA using the operation of G. What can we then conclude about how those elements interact in H? they also commute in H. So elements which commute in G are associated to elements which commute in H. Fourth, suppose that G has a generator. So suppose A is an element of G whose powers generate the entire group. This would imply, by definition, that G is a cyclic group. So if A is a generator for G, we'll be able to conclude that its image, phi of A, is a generator for H. And the reverse is also true. G is generated by an element if and only if H is generated by the image of that element under the isomorphism. So isomorphisms send generators to generators. Fifth property is also that the order of elements is invariant under isomorphism. This is something that even way back in this semester when we were first talking about how to tell when two groups were the same, one of the only tools we had in our toolbox back then was to determine the orders of elements. It was way back in chapter 3 or 4. Right? And we were able to conclude, well, these two groups aren't the same because some of the elements over here have certain orders that other elements in this group over here don't. And this is the codification of that. That an isomorphism will send order to order. The order of an element in G and the order of its image in H under this isomorphism are in fact the same. And this is actually something that is not true of homomorphisms in general. We actually would need the, um, 
the full isomorphism. We need the bijection property in order to make this conclusion as well. But at least in part, it's going to follow from 2 and 4, that powers get sent to powers and that generators get sent to generators. Here's kind of an interesting one. If I have an equation to solve in the group G, namely a, an equation x to the power k is equal to b, solve it for x. So how many kth roots in the group G uh, does the element b have? This theorem here says that b has as many kth roots in G as 5b has kth roots in H. These equations have the same number of solutions in the group G as in the group H. It's kind of an oddball one, but it's one that we might find useful later on in the course. And then finally, as a consequence of everything else, in particular uh, items 2, 4, and 5, the groups G and H are going to have the same number of elements of a given order. So if you ask me, how many elements of order 17 do G and H have? If G and H are both isomorphic, they both have to have the same number of elements that have order 17. So if G has five elements of order 17, then H has to have five elements of order 17 as well. So all of these things are sort of facets of sameness between these two groups at the level of their elements. All the elements of G have the same properties as the elements of H that are associated to those elements by this isomorphism. So to close out this video, what I want to do is show how these element sameness criteria can be used not to show that two groups are isomorphic, but to guarantee that two groups are not isomorphic. That's the real power of knowing about sameness, is being able to distinguish the differences that matter. So we can use any of these properties to spot fundamental differences between groups by finding a pair of elements, or uh, say, you know, finding a way to falsify one of these things um, on a pair of elements or on a set of elements in those two groups. So here's an example. Why is it not true that the additive group of order 12, C12, and the dihedral group of the hexagon, D6, how do we know that these are not, in fact, the same group? If we took the time to list out all the elements in these groups, we would find out that both groups have the same order. They both are groups of 12 elements. So what is it about the properties of those elements that guarantee difference between these groups? Well, Z12, the additive group of order 12, is a cyclic group. It's generated by, for example, the element 1. All the powers of 1, which in an additive group means the multiples of 1, account for all 12 of the residues mod 12. So Z12 is a cyclic group. And so if these groups were isomorphic, then property 4 would tell me that D6, the dihedral group of the hexagon, would also be a cyclic group, and it would be generated by phi of 1. So why is that not the case? Well, 1 is a generator of Z12, but phi of 1 cannot be a generator of D6, because D6 is not a cyclic group. How do I know that D6 is not a cyclic group? Well, every cyclic group is also, in particular, abelian. And D6, on the meantime, is not abelian. TR is not equal to RT. TR is, in fact, equal to R, time, or R to the fifth times T. Right? So because D6 is not abelian, it's not, therefore, cyclic, and therefore we can't have an isomorphism. Let's do one more example. Why isn't D6, again, dihedral group of the hexagon, 12 elements, the same isomorphic as A4, the group of even permutations of four elements? This is also a group whose order is 12. There are 12 elements in A4, 12 elements in D6. How do we know these groups are not isomorphic? Let's try to use property 7 and look at the orders of elements inside of these groups. So this I'm going to do totally explicitly, just to get the feel for it. In D6, the dihedral group of the hexagon, there's one element of order 1. It's always true in any group. It's the identity. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 elements of order 2. Actually, 7 elements of order 2, sorry. There's 2 elements of order 3, r squared and r to the 4th. These are the 120-degree uh, rotations of the hexagon. And there's 2 elements of order 6, the 60-degree rotation clockwise and the 60-degree rotation counterclockwise. So there's the order structure of all the elements in D6. If we do that same process for A4, A4 also has only one element of order 1, but A4 has a bunch more elements of order 3. All of the 3 cycles in S4 are elements of A4, they're even permutations, and there's a ton of them. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 elements of order 3 in A4. Furthermore, there's only 3 elements of order 2 in A4. The products of disjoint transpositions 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. 
So while d6 and a4 have the same number of elements of order 1, they have different numbers of elements of order 2, different numbers of elements of order 3, and different numbers of elements of order 6. After all, a4 has no elements of order 6. And even one of those observations would have been enough to falsify the isomorphism of these groups because it would kill property 7. So we can find a difference that matters between two groups by showing that those two groups have different number of elements of a given order. For example, elements of order 2, elements of order 3, elements of order 6. Any one of those comparisons kills the sameness between d6 and a4. So these element level properties are super useful for detecting a difference, showing that two groups are not isomorphic. In the next video, we'll see how group and whole subgroup and substructure level observations can also help us to do the same.